four. Appreciate you all being here. And uh, we've got a really good conversation here today talking about crypto adoption in Latin America. And um, before we get started, I would just encourage you to go ahead and scan that QR code up there uh, and fill out the little form. And then that will be your ticket to getting some exclusive Transfero swag uh, after the talk. So uh, scan that little code and then um, make sure you claim your swag afterward. And uh, also, we'll be. This will be kind of uh, just an interactive conversation here. I'll have some time for. Hopefully, we'll have some time for Q and A at the very end. So, if you have any questions, um, you know, kind of keep them till the end, and then we'll try to get to uh, whatever questions you might have. And um, without further ado, uh, we'd just like our guests to introduce themselves here. Uh, I'll introduce myself first, really quick. I'm Aaron Stanley. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, Brazil Crypto Report, which is a uh, podcast newsletter platform, English language, a little bit of Portuguese, mostly English, really just devoted to trying to uh, just provide more content and material about, about what's happening in the Brazil, Latin America uh, crypto ecosystem. Uh, just a lot of exciting things happening here that uh, sometimes don't get quite the publicity they need to. So I've been working really hard just to try to highlight what the, the builders here are building and, and some of the developments. Um, and then I'm joined by Marlison, uh, who is the CEO of Transfero. Uh, probably needs no introduction, but uh, we'll let him introduce himself as well. Uh, and then Daniel Marquez, who's come all the way from Colombia to join us. Uh, <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, but Marlison, why don't you kick off? Just give us a quick introduction to yourself and Transfero. Okay. Uh, hello, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Marlison. I'm the founder and the CEO of Transfero. We founded this company in 2015. So as you can imagine, since 2015, we are talking about Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain, and struggling with all of others players in the market and it's still alive. So nowadays we are transacting between at least seven countries uh, with several solutions for cross-border payments, um, payments and pay, uh, fiat on off-ramps, uh, crypto swaps, and we have some apps that you can download and test our APIs. So we are capable of offer to you or your company solutions for payments, receive crypto, transform and uh, change crypto into fiat. And now we are working with other continents. So Brazil, Argentina, Europe, US, uh, and next months, maybe Africa and Middle East, okay? Very cool, very cool. So we'll hear more about Transfero here as we, we uh, continue the conversation. But uh, Daniel, uh, why don't you give us a quick introduction to yourself and what you do? Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm Daniel Marquez. I'm a partner at Koyamaki Ventures. We're a crypto-focused uh, VC firm with a regional focus in Latin America. Uh, I am originally from Colombia, but grew up in the United States. Uh, and before I came back to Latin America and started investing in the region, I studied applied cryptocurrencies at the MIT Media Lab. Very cool, very cool. So, uh, so this, this panel is obviously we're focusing a bit on uh, crypto adoption in Latin America broadly. So we've got a nice uh, array of viewpoints here. Marlison, you've obviously, you're Brazilian, you guys are a Brazilian company, but you do a lot of business across the region and the rest of the world as we're, we're learning. And then Daniel's got a good view of, of just the happenings across the continent as well. So Marlison, maybe just from the Transparo perspective, uh, you know, we're sitting here in April 2024. How would you describe uh, just crypto adoption in Latin America right now? What are what's what's sort of the you know the, the zeitgeist, if you will, as far as who's who's doing what with crypto here? Uh, Aaron, I think that this is an interesting question because because the people right now they are more educated about the crypto ecosystem. So right now you understand about what is what look looks like a pyramid. A pyramid, a pyramid, or a scheme, and what hap what looks like a real projects. So now you can have more people talking about crypto, understanding what crypto is, what blockchain technology is, and now you have the central bank of Brazil with their own blockchain, with their own token called Drax, and now it's easier to tell the people about the crypto. Uh, five years ago, it was a, a, a tough game to explain what was Bitcoin, what was blockchain, that was not a scam, that was just technology. And now some colleges, colleges are 
teaching about crypto. So this is the right point that we have now. And I think that it's an amazing time to talk and learn the capability of this technology to enter in our lives. And then, Daniel, maybe from your perspective, uh, you're obviously based in Colombia and you've, you've taken a very strong regional focus toward uh, you know, investing in crypto projects in the region and just really trying to understand uh, kind of who's doing what in this region. Um, how would you describe you know, the state of crypto adoption here generally in, in 2024? Uh, I think there's two main drivers in the region. One is uh, a need for it. And so like one of the first ones being Argentina that done a lot of really interesting uh, work for creating systems that are decoupled from the existing system that was breaking down for different reasons. Uh, and then on the opposite side, you have Brazil that is pushing very friendly regulations that is enabling legitimate and actual institutional adoption. So sometimes in previous bull markets, you'll hear JP Morgan Chase in the United States being like, we are doing something crypto related, but really it's just so they can say that they're doing something, but they're not really actually taking uh, adoption seriously because it's a regulatory risk, it's a litigation risk, and it's a reputational risk. So with the type of regulation that's being passed here in Brazil with the central bank, the CVM, allowing the tokenization of assets, you enable uh, these large financial institutions to have legitimate adoption without having the reputational risk, without having the regulatory risk and litigation risk. Very cool, very cool. And um, there's been a lot of talk about stablecoin adoption in the region as well. Um, Obviously, Argentina is a big uh, one of the biggest users of USDT on the planet. One of like the highest adoption rates. Uh, also, in places like Mexico and Colombia, you're seeing uh, very high amounts of, of like remittances uh, being you know being transferred in stable coins. Someone was telling me this morning that at, like 10 percent of Mexico's total remittance volume is is like is uh, is in stable coins now, or, so, or is is something like. I mean, I don't know how reputable that is, but someone's just telling me that. Uh, but anyway, Marlison, uh, we'd love to get your thoughts on like what is you know what are you seeing as far as stablecoin adoption? And you guys obviously have your own stablecoin, uh, so feel free to plug that. Uh, but just even just gem more generally, what are you guys seeing as far as stablecoin adoption? Who here had some problem trying to send money abroad Brazil? Anyone here? Okay, someone. In 2019. Uh, my partner and I, we created a fund, a crypto fund in Bahamas, okay? So we incorporated the company there, we started the services, and we needed to send the money to incorporate the company. And all our banks just don't, don't allow us to send the money for our own company. And in 2019, we created the BRZ. So our major problem, or uh, objective was to make companies about Brazil accept the BRZ, exchange it for USD, and believe in, in transfer that we will buy again the, those BRZs. So nowadays it's easier to send and receive money using this, the, these stable coins. Um, so in Brazil, for example, uh, the major tokens transacted in Brazil are Tether, a stable coin, US stable coin. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and BRZ. The people are buying BRZ to reach the global market. So with BRZ, you can buy dollars, euros, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other options. And at the end of the day, transfer or buy again those BRZs every day. And just in, in transfer, we are moving between five and $10 million per day using BRZ. In Argentina, with our ARZ, we reach it uh, 4 billion pesos moving uh, in a monthly basis. And now we are looking into emerging markets, trying to figure out how to help people because every single emerging market, they have the same problem that we had in Brazil. So how to reach the global market using stable coins. And then maybe let's, let's kind of double click and, and dive a bit deeper into that and help us maybe understand the like the mix of retail and uh, more uh, like B2B use cases. Um, so obviously there's the retail case, use case is maybe kind of easy to understand where it's like, okay, I just need an easy way to transfer money. Uh, that's not using a, a bank transfer or not, you know, but um, also 
what are some of like the, the business use cases that you guys are seeing uh, a lot of adoption with? Uh, talking about crypto, the normal users, the normal users use BRZ to reach some platforms as Bybit. Bybit is a crypto exchange and they are using the transfer of services in Brazil and Argentina. And a number of users send a PIX to our bank account. We convert the fiat currency into BRZ, into their wallets in Bybit account. And they can buy and sell or, or, or buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, or even USD. This is the normal user for retail. Access a global platform and have access to a global market. On the B2B side, uh, I can tell you that Argentina has, uh, they have more problems than, than Brazil. For example, in Argentina, we have this trapped cash event. A company are not allowed to send money every day to their main branch. So using stable coins, using the transfer of services there, they can send money every day to their main branch because the regulators in Argentina is, is a little bit different from Brazil. So for the B2B side, I think that the larger, the, the larger volumes and lower fees are the, the, best, the best scenario to use uh, stable coins. So, it, so if I'm a company, if I'm, if I'm like say an e-commerce company that's that's you know based in, in Europe or or anywhere else, and I'm looking for just kind of a uh, you know a plug and play solution to be able to offer my services in in Brazil or at least you know start uh, onboarding Brazilian customers, what you guys are offering is essentially uh, kind of a much easier on ramp to doing that than you know the standard procedure that like kind of the, you know going through the, the traditional financial system, I guess trying to to do that. So it, it, you guys have created a solution whereby I can kind of just come in and just start immediately like, like plug and play, plug in the APIs, plug in using the BRZ stable coin, begin to accept PIX payments from, from customers. And then, um, and then basically you guys handle everything on the back end. And then, you know, as a, as a business, I, I receive, I can either keep the BRZ or I can exchange it for USDT or I can exchange it for fiat uh, in my home jurisdiction, uh, whatever I want to, however I want to manage my treasury in that sense. Am I understanding that correctly? Is that, that that's kind of like the, the core or one of the core client profiles there? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we offer this infrastructure that you can receive and send money through our APIs. We can convert to crypto. You can, be, you can stay in our stable coins. And anytime that you need to receive money in your bank account, we are able to send money to your bank account or even exchange for another stable coin that you want. And... On top of this, we can help you to gain some market because we have some media channels that we can help you to gain uh, a piece of th this market as well. Got it, got it. Um, so Daniel, tell us a bit more about what you're seeing on the ground in Colombia specifically, uh, where you're based. I know Colombia is interesting for a couple of reasons. I think, A, we've been, like we mentioned before, there's been a lot of remittance volume. And then also, I've noticed that there's a lot of like the large Colombian banks that have been uh, entering into partnerships with crypto exchanges, um, which I don't fully understand why that's happening, but it's it's pretty interesting. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe just tell us a bit more what's happening on the ground in Colombia specifically. Yeah. Oh, uh, a couple of years ago, the central bank created a sandbox for banks to uh, work with exchanges. Um, I, I personally say that unfortunately nothing really has come has come out of that. There hasn't really been any interesting reports or anything, any interesting um, like real world applications outside of this sandbox. Uh, generally speaking, the for for the most part, Colombia regulation has been in a gray area that's trending upwards. There was a law for uh, like three three years that was like trying to get pushed that got kind of like killed at the end of at some point last year. But a new law has been proposed to help regulate crypto in a, in a clearer manner. Um, I think that that will be interesting and that will hopefully be more, uh, that will actually create more um, useful adoption by these institutions. And so this sandbox will hopefully play to have educated the institutions into um, understanding what the opportunity is for the region. Uh, and when clearer regulation outside of the sandbox gets passed, then hopefully they'll be ready to uh, start implementing what they've learned. Got it, got it. Yeah, and that, that sometimes that's the, the double-edged sword of these sandboxes is sometimes it's easy to do something interesting inside the sandbox, but to scale that, like, 
outside of the sandbox into a, you know, a real business or a real venture sometimes is a bit tricky. Um, and then, I mean, you guys also hosted DevCon in 2022. So DevCon is the big uh, Ethereum developer conference that's usually held every year. It hasn't really been last couple of years just because of COVID, but, um, but, it's, but it was hosted in uh, Bogota in 2022, which was a really big event because it was the first time like a really like a major uh, crypto blockchain industry conference uh, had been hosted in Latin America. And um, just wondering if you could maybe give some reflections on that and what have been maybe the, uh, the ripple effects of, of hosting that event in Colombia uh, among the local community. Yeah, I think it's done a good job at creating a community that actually didn't exist prior to that. So Ethereum Colombia popped up after this um, or, or during the, the planning and the lead up to DEF CON, Ethereum Colombia was founded. They helped organize DEF CON with the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, and after they left, uh, they received some funds from a, from, from a grant uh, that has helped sustain them. Uh, and so they've done a good job, more local, kind of like Ethereum Bogota, Ethereum Medellin, um, Ethereum uh, Cauca, and all these other ones have kind of like popped up. Uh, so regionally, it has definitely helped to seed uh, more interest. I think what it also did is that um, it opened up the eyes of the real opportunity for, I would say, normies, people that had heard about it. And, and in Colombia, there's a context with crypto of like pyramid schemes. Um, and so like it's had like a negative reputation in that sense. So having this like massive conference, very beautifully planned, very well oiled, uh, kind of opened up the eyes to a lot of people that had this vision of cryptos only being something in the sphere of pyramid schemes to being something that le is legitimate and uh, that is uh, that has like legit like real potential to improve the lives of uh, day to day. Yeah, I, I would agree with that last point, and especially in an event like like Web Summit here in Rio, which is obviously more than just crypto, but we're here talking about crypto. It does give kind of a sense of legitimacy, like this is. There's something real that's being built here. It's not, it's not just you know some of the negative headlines you might see on on television or whatnot. Um, but Mar Marlison, um, maybe tell us a bit more. I'm really intrigued to learn more about what you guys are doing uh, in your international expansion. So you mentioned you know looking at some African markets and some other emerging market countries that uh, have some of the, have similar profiles to Brazil and other Latin American countries in terms of at least in terms of the problems people face with exchanging money. Right. So I would love if you could tell us a bit more about like how you're taking the lessons you've learned here and maybe applying them into some other markets. OK. Uh, the, the interesting point of this question is that we don't know how our others, brothers and sisters from Latin, they feel about their own problems. Right. So in Brazil, we had this perspective that only in Brazil, you are locked to send money abroad and you have some problems. And when we went to Argentina, we find out that the problem there was bigger than in Brazil. And talking, talking with some Venezuelan guy, in Venezuela, it's impossible to, to, to do something. And I have this new mission. Uh, I talked with a CEO from Chile. She has this wallet, but the, she is a uh, Venezuelan, so the, their dream, her dream is to create some solution for Venezuelans. Because in Venezuela, they, they don't have a smartphone, they cannot use the, the, the SWIFT, the banks, they are struggling with the banks. And we see that crypto is the only way to help them to change their way to survive, okay? So about Transfero. Transfero is fully operational in Brazil, Argentina, using our own stablecoins in US and Europe, using other stablecoins as USDC, USDT, and EUROC. Um, we have several projects trying to convince, convince us to create another stablecoins from US or EUROS, but we are studying. But our main point is to allow Chile, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Africa, at least two or three countries, I'm, uh, uh, Nigeria, Angola, and South Africa, and Middle East, Dubai, Qatar, and Abu Dhabi. Maybe these countries will be into our infrastructure in the next six months. Uh, this, this is our, our dream, our main goal. But uh, 
the main point is how can we connect with other projects and allow them to use our infrastructure. Maybe you here, you have this project running into another country and we can allow you transacting into our infrastructure and maybe you can allow us to use our, your infrastructure to, to transact in another country. So let's, let's connect and maybe we can create a new solution that will help other people, okay? Yes. I, I think to add to that in a way, uh, a little bit more abstract is that Brazil's a really interesting global use case for the applications of crypto. Uh, it is the first major country with over a 200 plus million pop in population, like billions of assets that can be tokenized um, that uh, is doing this in a, in a manner that I think is at the right time for people to start copying and pasting what's happening here, right? Um, for varying reasons, regardless of your like political stance, you can, you, you can say that there's a lot of people in the world, especially the global south, that are annoyed at the over-regulation uh, or over-sanctions of the U.S. government with SWIFT. And so uh, what's happening in Brazil, a lot of people around the world are keeping an eye on and keeping a good pulse on. They're asking the central bankers, hey, why are you doing this? How is it going? Because they want to implement what they're doing here in their own countries. And so as things grow in Brazil, you're going to start seeing the same type of solutions pop up around the world and mainly around the global south. Yeah, and that's that's a good point, Daniel. And that's that's been kind of one of my my theses as well that I really try to emphasize to to people who are are interested in the region. It's like, look, I think the same way that you have countries trying to replicate what Brazil has developed with PICS, I I think countries are going to begin looking at what Brazil is doing in terms of regulation with that central bank and also like the Drex project. If these thing if this thing you know actually works as it is expected to or as it is hoped to, I think people. Uh, from outside, we'll begin taking a closer look and be like, hey, maybe like this, this seems like a model that works. I think we need to try just copy and paste and, and maybe make it our own, but but take the broader principles that Brazil has developed here. So I think that's super interesting. Um, and Daniel, maybe putting on your investor hat here, maybe talk a bit about what are your kind of core theses for investing in the region, like when you're looking at projects or what are some of the things that uh, the areas that you're really excited about right now in, in 2024? Sure. Uh, there's probably like, there's three things I want to mention in regards to that. There's, there's two things that I see, one that I think is overplayed and one that I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it grows and one that I wish existed more. So the first thing that I see is overplayed is like there's a lot of wallets that a lot of, so a lot of maintenance of solutions. So as an investor, I'm not necessarily as interested in those because it's, you know, it, it's, there, there's so many, there's so much competition that um, picking a winner in that, in that horse race is, is difficult. Um, on the other hand, there's really interesting things that are being built on top of these regulatory frameworks that are being created, especially here in Brazil. So I view it as like, it's, it's FinTech for the population with crypto rails. And so that infrastructure is still being built. And there has, there's not like one declared winner there. Uh, and there's not a lot of competition. Um, so it's, I find that to be a very interesting uh, space for entrepreneurs to be building on. Uh, one thing that I would hope to see more of is more of my like DGen hat, which is like more like Web3, like just solid Web3 applications that are not necessarily plugged into some system. And so some, a lot of those have come out of Argentina, but like years ago, and like I haven't really seen a new one pop up at the same level of like PoApp or Decentraland um, or even Open Zeppelin. And like Open Zeppelin is like one of the foundational pieces of the like EVM world pretty much. Um, they're, smart con they're open source smart contracts like are used by mostly every new protocol. Um, but I wish that there would be more like interesting DeFi protocols that are popping out of Latin America. Yeah, I, I think specifically, to, I think that applies specifically to Brazil as well in the sense that a lot of the interesting projects you see in crypto, like that are, are you, you know, crypto or blockchain related, you see kind of emerging out of this. Um, it's, I don't want to say it's like, it's almost like an outgrowth of, of the, the existing kind of fintech ecosystem, right? So it's not necessarily like a degen project that exists in its own parallel universe, like, you know, kind of the original vision of crypto might, might, might have you believe. But it's, it's, more, it's more things that are kind of outgrowths of the existing system. And we haven't really had a lot of, um, uh, I guess, how would you say it? Like really just like pure Web3 projects coming out of Brazil. I think also in particular, um, 
like that is okay in Brazil because the opportunity is so massive in Brazil, right? Uh, the the population, the financial market of it is is massive. So building out this infrastructure that again, I think that if you build out solid infrastructure that works in Brazil, you can take that and apply it to new countries that are passing similar regulations. So I I have less complaints about that in Brazil, but probably more complaints about that in the region outside of Brazil because there's not the same regulation. It's not the same opportunity. And so I I wish I could see more of these like maybe uh, interesting like DeFi solutions as opposed to another wallet or another uh, uh, remittance application. Um, and then Marlison, uh, kind of pivoting here to the Drex project, uh, which is we've alluded to here, but the, the, the big uh, central bank uh, digital currency smart contract tokenization platform that the central bank is creating. Um, maybe talk, I mean, we're gonna have a couple other sessions on Drex later of the week, so we don't need to go like super deep into it here, but uh, maybe talk a bit about how, how does Transfero fit into this equation here, into this environment that the central, like, okay, like they're going to be, you know, they're going to be creating their own Drex stable coin, right? Like how does the BRZ fit into that environment? Um, like, like, why do we need BRZ if we're going to have Drex, right? Like, like there's a lot of questions I think people have about, I mean, I mean, we're the experts and we still have questions too. So I don't think anybody really understands this stuff, but you know, but like tell, talk about how you see Transfero fitting into this environment that, that, uh, or this, this direction that the, the central bank is going here in Brazil. Okay. I really believe that the central bank will take care about the population and will not allow themselves to make some error that breaks the entire system. So BRZ, with BRZ, you can access DeFi protocols, you can exchange for crypto, you can invest in some pools with Drex. Maybe you can have this access or this capability, but not this year, not next year, maybe someday. And there is a lot of information that we need to study more about the Drex because Drex is the platform, the blockchain or infrastructure and the token that will allow us to create this smart contract and transact between inside the Drex. Okay, so we need to study more about We, we need to study uh, a lot of <laughs> we need to study more about Drex because Drex is the infrastructure, okay, the blockchain, and the token, the smart contract that will transact be inside the Drex. So, in next year, if you can buy a car using Drex behind, will be great. But I, I don't know if if they will allow us to use this because the regulator needs to be sure that there is no error inside the system. Meanwhile, BRZ keep growing and you can exchange BRZ for Drex if they release because the Transfero is a, a payment institution. So we can exchange crypto to fiat. So for us, we'll be okay to exchange uh, DeFi tokens, etc., for the real world assets. So. Uh, you can see Transfero as a bridge connecting Drex and the DeFi. For example, nowadays we have some protocols allowing people to lend in money for some companies that need this money with, a, with some lower fees. Uh, so we are fighting with the banks with using the fees because DeFi, we have this, this approach. Okay, you can lend money for everyone. You don't need who? Uh, you are lending money and on on the other hand in transfer we can pick the right partner to borrow money so uh, I see a, a, a huge a huge connection between transfer BRZ and Rex and imagine you may uh, executing a PIX in Brazil and receiving a instant payment uh, in, in Argentina or Lisbon and maybe in Lisbon executing uh, MBA or in Switzerland uh, tweet and receiving a PIX or investing in some Drax options or et cetera. So this is possible using our infrastructure. I think to add to that, uh, it's like trend, the central bank has done it. Like, like you said, the central bank doesn't want to have this be, have this have a negative impact on the population. 
And they've been really, one of the things that I like the most about what the central bank is doing is that they've mandated pretty much that they are building out the rails between financial institutions, but the user facing side is going to be handled by the institutions themselves. And so I think that's a really, really good way of doing this because these institutions themselves are going to have a better pulse as to like what solutions users want. And the central bank is just going to be in charge of making sure that the rails behind the scenes between financial institutions is working well. And then um, a couple more questions from me here, but I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience here as well uh, in a couple minutes here. So if you have a question that you want to just be thinking about that, and then I'll, after this next question, I will call on uh, folks here. Um, but um, Daniel, have you been following other um, kind of CBDC projects at all throughout the region? Uh, Central bank digital currency projects? Is this an area? I know there are a few of the other countries. I know Colombia has been, I think they have like a partnership with Ripple to like kind of study doing a potential CBDC. Um, and I think a lot of these things are probably not much further beyond just like the research and development phase. But is this something you've been tracking at all? A little bit, but there's nothing really substantial to keep it track of. I think so. For Colombia in particular, I think Colombia's at the moment like always like two to three years behind as to Brazil is doing. So like right now, Colombia is implementing their version of PIX, and so I think after they implement PIX, if it succeeds in the same manner that it succeeded in Brazil, I think it's natural for Drex to become or like the Colombian Drex to kind of come into Colombia, and whether that's done through that Ripple kind of like partnership or more with like a partnership with the central bank because Colombia is implementing their version of PIX with aid from the Brazilian central bank. And so I think like that's a, that would be like a, I, I would prefer that kind of partnership between regulators than just like kind of ripple taking that over completely. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but it is interesting that I think what's happening in Brazil here is being watched very closely by all the neighboring countries, right? Like there's, there's definitely a lot of copycatting going on here, if you will. Yeah, and, and it's very simple because anything that retains the status quo only really benefits the United States and doesn't necessarily benefit the regional uh, regulators. And so uh, I've talked about this in, in, other, in other instances, but it's the, the region and the world should be following what Brazil does because it benefits them and doesn't benefit the existing homogeny. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, anyway, any, uh, any question, burning questions from the audience here for, for our panelists? Yeah, um, maybe I'll, I'll give you the, the mic here. Just please introduce yourself. Yeah, hello guys. My name is Rodrigo. I'm an associate from Iporanga. I have a question for you. Uh, talking about like applications and mass adoption of crypto, what do you think about like using uh, especially tokenization in providing credit or even like building stable coins upon uh, credit card receivables to foster the financing of SMBs in Latin America and so forth? Uh, anybody want to take? Sure, yeah. I, well, I think it's, it's some, some, there are some solutions that kind of exist that are attempting to do that. Um, and w one of them is one of the companies who've invested in Amphi. Uh, they're tokenizing real world assets to create lending pools. Uh, and I think, I think it's actually very powerful. And the reason being is that it is adding more speed to like value that's being created in the real world uh, so that it can be attained by different people, right? So right now, uh, small, medium-sized enterprises are very limited as to what type of access they can get in credit from banks, right? That even if they've been, ha even they've been like in the black, you know, for like years and uh, have like a solid business, like they're not going to get the same type of like benefits that, like a large enterprise will get. And especially in Colombia, getting loans for these type of entities is difficult. So when you create these kind of like lending uh, pools backed by their own real-world assets it frees them up to actually attain and scale at a level that banks and the current system is preventing them from. Uh, for, for example, we have a, a protocol that allows merchants to borrow money from a protocol. Uh, this protocol is called Kona, Kona.finance. So we see this, this need from, from our, for our uh, consumers or merchants, I see that we will see uh, uh, surging a lot of protocols to help people uh, to access money, to access cash flow for companies and and. But 
firstly, we need to study more. I, I think that the main point that we need to, to tackle is the education. Because if the people don't know about the financial education, about the, the, how the market works, uh, they will keep struggling with their own, own, own market. So we need to study more about all these options that we have now with crypto. And maybe we will see surging or creating a lot of new solutions. Yeah, and I, I see this this whole framework as really. Oh. Oh, okay. I see this as really one of the most promising uh, developments of, of crypto, and I think even just looking back to when I first started learning about you know the like the Maker DAO and like these Maker Vaults when they first started rolling these out back in 2018, where the, the idea was simple: okay, you take your your ETH and you lock it as collateral, and then you can take out you know a loan in stable coins against the value of your ETH. Like, oh wow! Like if you could take you know, a real world asset, like your house, your car, or your, or an invoice, right? Or a, any type of uh, other commodity, like your soybeans, tokenize that, lock that, it, be able to it, obtain instant liquidity against that asset. It's like, well, that's a game changer right there. Um, like how you actually do that, uh, you know, is a lot more complicated, but, but just the idea in itself, like once you get it, you're like, wow, this could free up just like massive amounts of, of just locked working capital. Um, so it is exciting to see that there is a lot more attention being paid to like real world. I mean, it's kind of a buzzword now, real world assets, right? But, you know, I, I'm excited to see that people have, have, there's a lot of just like interest and investments and, and just development going into these things and, you know, figuring out how we can get to a point where, you know, you really have that. I mean, this is where I think something like Drex really comes into play. Cause it's hard to envision a framework where, you know, a, a, like you could have a scale like this, this, this becomes a scalable part of the financial system without having kind of like the blessing of the government or the central bank in some capacity. Right. Um, so I think having like the Drex uh, platform that that enables these assets to be tokenized and enables new kind of products to be built on top of it. You know, I, I that's what I, I mean, that, that's that's the use case that makes me. Mo I mean, I like meme coins, but like this is the use case that makes me like really excited. So. Uh, but it's like getting there is just there's a lot that goes into it, right? Because there's so much of the existing financial engineering you have to kind of redo and rethink. Um, any other questions? Uh, any questions? Fair game. So. Thank you. Congrats for the conversation. Very good. Would be nice to have this conversation all the day long. Okay. But only one question. Maybe you could give some advices for companies that are not working not working on finance markets because for finance markets this is uh, the nature of day-to-day -day work today okay but for manufacturing companies and so on um, maybe each one of you could give one advice for strategic perspective that any other companies would have today about this matter Considering the adoption of the crypto on Latin American. Anybody want Daniel want to take that? Sure. I mean, I think it's very much dependent on and manufacturing is pretty broad. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about an investment we made recently in manufacturing, uh, which is trying to decentralize like small scale manufacturing. Uh, and so there's uh, it's called three DOS. What they do is they have a network of uh, hundreds of thousands of 3D printers around the world. And you can, you know, they, they, you can choose to have stuff 3D printed uh, by them uh, anywhere in the world. And then you, they deliver it or like you pick it up wherever, right? And so they're starting with 3D printing and want to do that with CNC mills and, you know, uh, other kind of like small scale manufacturing like that. So there's, there's, there's interesting applications in that regards. Uh, I think, um, Speaking of the like the question previously, it, th these types of uh, entities can sometimes uh, yeah, these type of entities can uh, sometimes benefit from easier ways of getting loans to scale their own operations, right? And so I think that that's also an interesting opportunity, right? Like you maybe you have certain things that you can. Uh, used to back up a loan on the blockchain, that would be difficult to do otherwise. Um, yeah. And then I, I would also maybe just put in a quick plug for, uh, this is kind of outside the scope of this talk perhaps, but like for decentralized physical infrastructure networks, it's kind of an, another buzzword, I guess, but it's it's something that we're seeing a lot of development uh, in, in, in crypto right now. 
So things like decentralized computing networks, decentralized data storage networks, decentralized like weather collection networks. And the idea is trying to take these, these, these kind of hardware infrastructure um, services essentially that are today very centralized, like a data center, like your data stored on AWS or on Google Cloud. And you're, you know, when you need to do run an AI application, that's all being run through like NVIDIA data centers on their GPUs, right? But the, there's, a, there's a movement now to try to recreate these as essentially decentralized networks, which um, they're still in the early days, but these are things that I think if they can, if they can scale properly, they can provide you know, competitive alternatives to things like a Google Cloud as far as storage and commute services, uh, or um, you know, especially as artificial intelligence use cases grow. And you know, at the end of the day, like, every, like, every company is going to end up needing to use artificial intelligence in some capacity. Um, but like, there's, there's just not enough GPUs to be able to handle all this compute power right now. So there's going to have to be new ways of allocating these resources. Um, so there's a movement to create, you know, essentially decentralized GPU networks that where, you know, I, okay, I have a, you know, a GPU farm in my garage and it's not being used, but I'll rent it out to somebody who needs that compute power for a given amount of time. So, uh, Daniel, you want to chime in there? Yeah. Well, I think like another kind of like use case that could be added that's being worked on and no one has solved it yet, um, is like supply, supply chain tracking. Um, that's a really interesting use case. There's a... There's a problem with like the garbage in, garbage out of data on the blockchain. But if that can be resolved in some way, shape, or form, and there's enough consensus around a particular system, then that's a really powerful mechanism for uh, manufacturers to prove that they are greener for some reason, and therefore an incentive for you know consumers that care about that to purchase them over the competition or even proving that because they are optimized in energy consumption for X, Y, Z reason, they can get certain credits from the government for tax purposes. So like that type of thing is also very interesting. Uh, unsolved yet, uh, there's a handful of people working on that, but no winner in that race course yet. We've got one more question uh, in the back there. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Leo from Finding Markets. Um, I have a question back to Marlis Hahn. Um, what are the use cases that you see for uh, BRZ? Um, do you think that it will be more focused on the retail, on individuals who are going to be using the currency? Or is it more cross-border payments with trading partners in Asia, trading partners in Europe, you know, who can interact with the Brazilian economy in a much more holistic way? What do you see? What is the you know, bigger focus for you? Okay. Uh I think that this year BRZ will be used more for cross-border payments and allow uh, foreigns or people outside Brazil to invest in Brazil using BRZ, okay? The retail, they will use BRZ just to access platforms outside Brazil, but as soon as the people are studying and educated about the crypto, they will start to use BRZ in a daily basis. For example, I. I'm not using my cards from now, my banks. I'm using BRZ to pay my bills. So this is uh, what happens with me. When I travel, I don't pay, I, I don't need to exchange dollars or euros. I use BRZ to pay uh, my, for coffee, for my, my, my trip, because uh, you can download the transfer app and you see that you can create a virtual card and you can top up with a Pix and use this card, okay, this virtual card. And after that, you can use this in any POS that you, you encounter that. But for this, for the retail, we need more education. But for the B2B side, they already know about the BRZ. They are using to pay some trading options. The COMEX market are using BRZ. The Chinese market, they are using BRZ to receive for payments of, of, of some products. And I think that this year, the B2B side will won the war for, uh, for using BRZ. But maybe next year, the retail will be using BRZ so much more in a daily basis. Okay, okay. we got one more question here. Hey, so I'm a software developer and I have a quick question. I, I'm sorry for like a, a dumb question, but do you think 
for me, one of the biggest principles of crypto and blockchain is their freedom. It's like no one can control what you do with your money. Do you guys think that the implementation of CBDCs like Drax may not follow up to this principle? Oh. Uh, sure, yeah. That, like, I mean, if from like one extreme, you have like the genesis of Bitcoin and being something completely decoupled to the system because it's corrupt for X, Y, C reasons. Um, but the so something like that, like Bitcoin or an Ethereum uh, that are sufficiently decentralized, it doesn't matter what happens with CBDCs. I will say that my grandma and my aunt and uncle are not going to be using Bitcoin for transactions or they're not going to be using Ethereum for lending. Uh, and so these uh, kind of like fintech solutions with crypto rails that involve CBDCs and some reg and regulatory frameworks um, are perfectly fine because it improves the existing system. Uh, and I think the, the caveat is that like there are good systems and there are bad systems. And I would say Brazil is under the category of a good system. They've been, and the reason being is that like they've made it so that there's a focus on consumer privacy because of us and they've made it a focus so that they themselves are not interfacing with users, but creating the, um, the infrastructure for financial institutions to interface with those users. And so it depends, right? If you have like uh, an extreme of like a CBDC, like in China, where like there's full control of everything and there's zero privacy, then like that's very antithetical. But then you have somewhere like that's kind of in the middle of what uh, Drex is doing, which is, yeah, it's definitely like very centralized, but at the same time has certain key parts that want it to be explicitly focused on consumer privacy. And I'll take a stab at that as well. I mean, I, I think the answer is to your question is like, I mean, the reason people, a lot of people get excited about crypto is this idea of like freedom and even, and even maybe less about like freedom or like crypto anarchy or all these kind of things. But even just like the idea of having like an opt out to the system, right? I think, you know, the, the more, the more I, I, I've, I've been in this industry for about, you know, seven, eight years now, kind of pretty actively participating in various angles. And I think the, 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 the real secret power that crypto holds is not to create this kind of like, you know, libertarian fantasy, you know, type of, you know, island thing or whatever that we all just move off to. But it's really to, it's to create competition that governments have to address, right? Like, look at, you know, look at what's happening in, 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 you know, even a place like, um, like in Colombia, where like, you cannot have like a USD denominated bank account in Colombia, right? Like if you're a Colombian citizen, and you want to have dollar exposure, like you, that's illegal, like you can't do that in a bank account. But you can have you can hold USDT in a crypto wallet. Like, and there's no way the government can just like come and just like, I mean, I guess they could, you know, ban you, they could like technically ban you, but like, they can't stop you from doing that, right? So you're, it's creating this competition that the government has to factor in somehow. And what I like, with the, to, to, to piggyback on what Daniel is saying, what, what, what Brazil has taken or the central bank has taken is they're like, we're not, we're not trying to like ban this stuff. We're not going to try to tell people it's bad. Don't use it. They're like, look, there's some really interesting values that have been spun up in this crypto ethos, right? The, the privacy, the interoperability, the, the, the financial inclusion elements. And they've 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 really like embraced a lot of these values. Like, how can we build a system that really embraces these things and really you know provides maximum benefit? You know, we're not just trying to do this to like you know create a surveillance state or like dystopian thing. Like, so I, I think that's that's the value that I think you know people like yourself are are creating by is is, is you, these values have to continually be elevated, and there have to be these systems created that do provide this competition that the government has to respond to, right? And like, like I was saying, we've, it's, it's, it's proven that like they will respond, right? If, if there's no competition, they're just gonna do whatever the heck they want. But if there's competition and people want these solutions, like they have to eventually, um, you know, they can't, like they might be able to, you know, ban, you know, five or 10 people from using, they can't, they can't ban, like if 20% of the population is using Tether, like they can't ban tether, right? They can't. They can't just like shut off something for like twenty percent of the population. So, like, I, I think that's the way. That's the way I've come to think of it. Of of this kind of this dichotomy that you mentioned is really, crypto is creating a potential opt out of the existing system of existing systems, I should say, and it's creating, and, and that 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 alternative system is creating competition that governments have to respond to. Um, so. 
anyway, that's my two cents on that. But <laughs> and the control, yeah, you 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 always was being controlled by the system, right? But the crypto side try to to take you to another place to make you feel more free. But as soon as you get freedom, they will come nearby you, and you need to find out how to make more freedom. So uh, this is the this is the, the run. You you try to figure out how to make your yourself free, but the system will get in, uh, nearby you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, really appreciate your time, everybody. Uh, appreciate everyone for coming. Um, Daniel Marlison, just really quick, any quick final thoughts? Uh, no, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks everyone for listening or for, for hanging out here. And uh, there'll be some programming later this afternoon as well. Uh, I don't have the schedule immediately in front of me, but there'll be a couple panels going on. And also be sure to scan that QR code to get your claim your swag, So, uh, which I think you can do after this. So, But thanks everyone for coming. Thanks to our speakers. And uh, we'll see you soon.